Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the first of hopefully many uh, online uh, free public lectures provided by the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. It is so good to see uh, so many joining us from all around the world. Uh, hello and good evening to everyone joining us in the UK, but especially because of the topic um, we have to say a hello and a bonjour tout le monde to everyone joining us in Canada and an especially friendly welcome and a worry out to everyone joining us from the beautiful province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, what I will say, um, we're going to go through the talk today and I'll be starting that in a moment. Um, we've got a lot of features and functionality with this online lecture system. If you have any questions at any point, there is a chat function you should be able to see on the right hand side of your screen. If you open that up and you send a chat and send it to the admins only, um, that will be there waiting for us at the end of the talk. And then we'll collect them all together and we will uh, hopefully answer some of your questions. So as we're going through, do add your questions to the list. Tell us who you are and where you're from, and we will get to those at the end. So today's talk is going to be on, it's got the title, Don't Walk on the Rocks, and that's playing a bit on the Oxford and Cambridge College tradition of having these signs, as you can see on the left-hand side there, these signs saying, keep off the grass. And it raises the question, do we need to do similar things for some very important fossils and rocks that we find around the world. So we're going to be having a bit of an introduction to the science of geoconservation. And we're also going to be looking at that through the lens of some sites, some very important sites in Newfoundland in Canada. So this topic, geoconservation, it raises issues and uh, questions about heritage and conservation. But when we think about heritage and conservation, we might think of some of the images that we see here, especially when we think about heritage. We might think about old buildings. You know, we've got the, uh, the UK Parliament there, some beautiful uh, buildings from Oxford, Stonehenge, Signal Hill Tower there from, uh, from St. John's, Newfoundland, and some of the beautiful historic buildings from Bonavista. But of course, Heritage and conservation is more than the things that we ourselves as humans have created, such as buildings. When we think about conservation, we might also think about some of the images here. Indeed, if you were to go on a, a, a web search for images associated with conservation, you will find precisely these images. Evocative big cats, um, beautiful flowers and insects, people nurturing plants and things like frogs and sea creatures. This is what people tend to think about when they're talking about conservation. But our feathered friend might ask a question. What about nature that isn't alive or what we might call abiotic nature? Don't we have to think about the conservation and the heritage of these things too? And our feathered friend there standing on the cliff is the perfect example of how these things are interlinked and we can't really separate them because our feathered friend, the, the goal there, relies on geology, a cliff, for its nesting site. Without the conservation of the geology, there can be no conservation of the wonderful animals and plants we see on this screen. So my first point is to impress upon you that we can't just leave behind geological conservation. It's all together and it's interlinked with the conservation of other things, both things like buildings, many of which are made of stone, and the rest of natural conservation. And here's a beautiful example of some of the rich and diverse geo heritage. That's the term we use for geological heritage that one can find. In the top left corner there, we've got a beautiful uh, image from the Northwest Highlands of Scotland. It is uh, a UNESCO global geopark. Um, 
at the right there above me, um, there's a picture from inside our lovely museum in Oxford. You can see individual specimens of, of fossil dinosaurs. They too are geoheritage. At the bottom, uh, to my left, you can see the wonderful cliffs of Whitby in Yorkshire. Very important, both scientifically, but also uh, just a wonderful uh, image and place to go to find fossils, to learn about these, uh, our, our wonderful earth history. But not to forget also the outcrop on the, the bottom left hand side. That is a very small outcrop. You wouldn't necessarily describe it as, as beautiful, but it's highly significant to understand a period called the Carboniferous in the UK. It is the most southerly outcrop of a particular part of the Carboniferous and is found under some bushes um, in Leicestershire. So my, my slide here is to show you that geoheritage and geoconservation, it's not just about beautiful mountains or beautiful, beautiful specimens. Things can be important for very different reasons. And we can have a look at that here by looking at the sites that UNESCO, part of the United Nations, the um, Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization of the United uh, Nations, the different reasons that they have classified a, a number of World Heritage sites, and all for geological reasons. So at the top there, we've got Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve in Newfoundland. We're going to be talking a lot more about that in a moment. And that was uh, classified and given World Heritage status in 2016 because it's scientific importance. And as I said, we'll, do, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Then we have places like Yosemite National Park and many other national parks that you can think of around the world. Um, these are what we might call aesthetic geosites. They are beautiful, stunning geology, and there may be science and other reasons uh, mixed in there as well. But first and foremost, they are beautiful, beautiful sites to go and uh, see. Uh, and that is all underpinned by the geology. We also have geological sites that are important for cultural reasons. And a classic example of that is Uluru in Australia, um, which holds particular significance um, for certain groups of people. And that too can be really important and is an important part of geoheritage. And then lastly, we have historic geosites. A classic example of that is the, the historic mining landscapes, the, the buildings and the infrastructure that were put in place for the mining of metals in the southwest of England, and they too have been recognized by UNESCO. So there's a number of different reasons why we might recognize geological heritage, why we might classify it, and then why we might give it a special designation, such as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But when we talk about geoconservation, the practice of looking after important geological sites when looking after geoheritage, we might look to other areas of conservation and say, well, if we want to conserve biology, if we want to look after a cheetah, as these scientists are doing, there's lots of research that's already uh, been done and is still being done in this area. If we wanted to apply that elsewhere, we could look at a, a, a large back catalogue about how to look after these wonderful animals and indeed other plants and things like that. There's also a lot of literature um, on the conservation of cultural heritage, things like paintings, things like buildings. And there's a lot of research and there's research ongoing. But the problem is geological heritage hasn't had so much research done on its conservation. And that means that sometimes we haven't had the science, the evidence, to choose what the right mechanism is. So what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is some of the pioneering research we've been doing based in Newfoundland um, and some of the impacts uh, that's been having on how we look after the rocks. And we're gonna talk about different things in different places. And also we might, maybe in the questions, we'll get onto how some of that's being applied elsewhere. So, as I say, the, the, the lens we're going to look through today to answer some of these questions about geological conservation and geological heritage, we're going to go to the Ediacaran of Newfoundland. The Ediacaran is a geological period 
And obviously, Newfoundland is a place. So this raises two questions. When is the Ediacaran? And where is Newfoundland? Which we'll have to start off with. So with any good geological story, we must put things in their context. Geology is all about time. It's about understanding Earth history. So we better have a very quick lesson in the history of the Earth. Now, the, the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. That's 4,500 million years old. You can see I've made a little time scale across the bottom there, going from the left, the start of the Earth, to the right. Little person walking along there, that's where we are in the present day. And each one of those blocks is half a billion years, 500 million years. Um, when a geologist puts MA, that means millions of years ago. So the Earth, 4,500 million years old. Now, it wasn't until roughly, depends who you speak to, as with so many things in science, there can be uh, debates and contention, but roughly about 3.4 billion years ago, that's 3,400 million years ago, we start to see the first evidence of life. And here's some uh, very tiny cells that are preserved in some rocks from Australia. Um, what you do is you slice the rock very, very thin, so thin that light can be shone through it and you can put it under a microscope and then we can see these very early cells. So this is the first evidence for life. And it's not until 1,000 million years ago, that's 1 billion years ago, that we see the first evidence for multicellular life. This is still a microscopic fossil, so it's microscopic uh, multicellular life. Um, it's called Bangiomorpha. Um, so for, you can already see, we've already told the story of most of the history of the Earth. And for all of this time, any life that's been around has been microscopic. We've only just got multicellular. And then everything, pretty much everything that you've ever heard of about geology, and especially fossils, is probably from that red block of time. That's called the Phanerozoic. Um, it's the past 540 million years, and it's when we see all the kinds of wonderful beasties and plants that we're used to seeing when we walk around um, the modern day world. So it's when uh, land plants evolve, uh, when we start to see amphibians and arthropods and dinosaurs and people so well represented there by Mary Anning, a wonderful uh, fossil collector and uh, paleontologist um, from the south coast of England. And then the question arises, well, what happens right at the start of that red bit? What changes then? And this transitional period between the that little blue area I put on there, that's called the cryogenian. That, if anyone's heard of the snowball earth periods, that's from the cryogenian. Then we move into the red of the Phanerozoic and this transitional period, geological period is called the Ediacaran. It runs from 635 until 540 million years ago. And as I say, it's a transition, both from the, the ice house world of the cryogenian into what is the relatively more stable climate of the Phanerozoic, though to us it still changes quite a lot, especially in the modern day. Um, but as well as being a climatic change and transition through the Ediacaran, it's when we see a transition in the kinds of fossils from a microbially dominated world to firstly seeing the first large complex multicellular organisms and also the first animals that we find um, or have found so far in the geological record. And that's something that I've been focused on uh, in my research is the understanding of the Ediacaran and why first animals uh, appeared, the context of the appearance of first animals. Now, one of the best places to see the Ediacaran um, and look at those very earliest large complex uh, life forms is in both Newfoundland and in the UK, um, which I've uh, highlighted there. Now, what we have to remember is that the Atlantic Ocean is a relatively new thing. I'm just going to jump back a slide. The Atlantic Ocean running down the middle there is a relatively new thing in terms of geology. And were we to go back to the Ediacaran, the Atlantic hadn't existed. So on the next slide, we see a world where the Atlantic hasn't opened up yet. 
And you can see that there are, all you need to take away from this is similar color equals related geology, similar geology. And you can see there in, our, in that red box, we've got Avalonia. And we're gonna focus on the Ediacaran of Avalonia. And that represents, this is a tiny paleo continent that existed um, half a billion years ago. And today we see the rocks of Avalonia in Eastern Newfoundland. It is after all named after the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland. Um, we also see it in Southern Britain and some of some other places in Europe, such as uh, the Netherlands. Um, it's a relatively small area, but it shares a common geology. And therefore we see very similar fossils at similar times. And it is the Avalonian Ediacaran rocks that contain the oldest evidence um, for large, complex, multicellular life forms. And what I'm going to show you is where was Newfoundland and southern Britain uh, back in the Ediacaran? So the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland I've marked with a blue star there, and southern Britain I've marked with um, a red star. And you can see this is a perfect example of how there is uncertainty in science. Many times science scientists will completely agree on a topic um, and what lovely occasions those are. But the exact position of Newfoundland um, 560 roughly million years ago is a debated topic. So we have to, obviously we have to remember um, that we have subtracted uh, the Atlantic. Uh, and so South America is stuck next to Africa in, in a continent we call Gondwana. And so we describe Avalonia as a peri-Gondwanan uh, terrain or a peri-Gondwanan paleocontinent, just means it's, it's a neighbor. It's a neighbor to Gondwana. But you can see, although there's a bit of disagreement about where we exactly put the, the blue star for Newfoundland and the red star for Southern Britain, they're roughly close to Gondwana. There is agreement uh, there. And we're gonna zoom in now to the geology of Eastern Newfoundland. Um, so specifically uh, the Avalon Peninsula, the Buren Peninsula and the Bonavista Peninsula. Um, all you need to take away from this is um, there is a lot of geology there. There's a lot of color. And if there's lots of color on a geological map, it usually means there's a lot of geodiversity. So although it's mostly Ediacaran rocks and the subsequent Cambrian rocks, we have many different colors. So we've got lots of different rock types. And that's why it's a brilliant, brilliant place to go and study this crucial period in Earth history and understand the appearance of the first animals. And we're gonna be looking at two sites today. The lower one of those with an arrow, that's the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Convention logo. So that's mistaken point on the southern shore of the Avalon Peninsula. And we're also going to be talking about the Discovery Aspiring Geopark. It has its application in at the moment to become a formal UNESCO Global Geopark. Hopefully there will be a meeting later this year when it will all get approved. And they're up on the Bonavista Peninsula of Newfoundland. So these are the two sites we're gonna be talking about. Now, let's go first to Mistaken Point. Um, on the left-hand side there, I've got a, a thing called a stratigraphic column. So this is a way that geologists represent geology. Um, so obviously, Geology in stratigraphy is layers, so we can nicely graphically uh, uh, represent that. Um, people like me go around and measure it, uh, and that's why there's the different uh, thicknesses there. And what we're going to do is we're going to start at the bottom, the lowest fossils that we find in the two and a half kilometers of thickness of beautiful geology that we find at Mistaken Point, and just detail some of the, the really interesting things there. And then we'll get on to some of the questions that that's raising about conservation and heritage. So at the bottom there, in what's called the Druk Formation, um, the th one of the thickest formations we find at Mistaken Point, these are rocks that are about 575 million years old. Here's a picture of um, Dr. Richard Thomas, who uh, was in charge of the bid for Mistaken Point to become a World Heritage Site, um, is a trained geologist and was also the uh, reserve manager for a while at, at Mistaken Point as well. And you can see him pointing out um, with his arms uh, a, a strange strip-like organism, and it's called Trapassia wardi. Um, Trapassia 
Um, that is its uh, genus name. This is named after the local town of Trapassi. Um, Wardai is, and we'll come on to more of this uh, later in the talk, named after a local family in the wonderful uh, town of Portugal Cove South who have been so important to both the recognition and the protection of these very, very important fossils. So what's really strange, bear in mind that I've already said these are the oldest large complex organisms that we know of, and everything before them that we've found so far is microbial. It's really striking that the very first thing we find, which is big, is not this big, it's two meters long. And this is what we see in Trapassia wardi. So if you'd have been at the bottom of the sea, 575 million years ago, it, to many of us, it would have been just a bit taller than us. This would have been a strange leaf-like organism living deep, deep in, in the sea. So deep, it would have been dark. There would have been uh, no sunlight getting through because it was so deep. So although I've used leaf-like because that's what it looks like in terms of morphology, uh, its shape and appearance, it could not have been a plant. This, these are strange organisms um, that people have been working on to try and crack what these actually are and where they fit within the tree of life. Um, so this would have been two meters tall. The first thing we see is actually huge. And two meters, of course, is a, a, a very useful measurement um, at the moment because you can use a Trapassia wardi as your perfect measuring stick um, for your social distancing. So if you're out and about and you're thinking, how far should I be away um, from, from other people? Think about a, a two meter long trapassia having fallen over um, between you. So a very, a very useful paleontological guide. As we go up, we find uh, more forms uh, uh, appearing. Here's um, a wonderful example of a fossil from um, what we now call the brazier surface in the Briscal formation. Um, this was discovered a few years ago by uh, Dr. Alex Liu. And you can see there the end of my pen. Um, it is tiny, this fossil, it's a, a fractifusus. And I merely show you this to show that though these fossils are very old, they are preserved in exquisite detail. This is a tiny, we might think of this as a little baby fractifusus, but it's pre preserved in, immaculate detail and you can see these frond like fractal shapes within it um, which is why people often say oh it looks quite like uh, a leaf the exact purpose uh, of of these shapes is still very much debated by uh, paleontologists some say that it is for um, the absorption of nutrients either from the ocean or from the sediment that they were lying on in the bottom of the deep deep sea um, others say it might be for the cultivation of microbes, which they could then uh, eat. Um, so there's a, a big debate going on. So there's a beautifully preserved baby fractifusus. And then uh, we go up to the mistaken point formation. And here's a lovely photograph from the famous E surface at mistaken point. And you can see there's some, a beautifully sunny day when we took this uh, photo and the waves crashing in the background. And here is the very famous uh, fossil surface. This is the surface that most people go to uh, when they go on a public tour. Um, and this is the site that most of the science has been done on uh, at this site. You can see there uh, two beautiful fossils. We've got a, a large fracture fusus there, about 15 centimeters long. Um, and then we have uh, a little uh, a little fossil there. I believe that's a plumero priscum. Um, we get some strange names uh, for our fossils in the Ediacaran of Newfoundland. And what you can see there is most of the surface is uh, brown, uh, but there's some areas of black and that's volcanic ash that's so important to the preservation. And we're gonna come on in a moment to have a look about how did the volcanic ash get there and why is it so important? But this is the E surface. This is the, the place that is so, so important for our understanding of these very early large fossils. And there's just another view. Um, you can see some of the, uh, these are fossils called Charnia discus. You can see they've all fallen over in the same direction there, which is a very uh, important indicator and uh, helps our understanding. They're the ones marked C.P uh, and C.S. They're a fossil called Charnia discus. You can see one marked B.M, that's Beothicus, um, which is a beautiful fossil. 
Um, and th this is, uh, again, from the E surface at mistaken point. So how are these things preserved? Where did they live? And what was going on in their life? Now we have to imagine, we have to remind ourselves these things lived in the deep sea. We know that because of the rocks that they are found in. So let's imagine 565 million years ago, if we're looking for the E surface, because that's how old the E surface is, 565 million years ago, there is an island in the middle of the sea that is a volcano, an, uh, an, an island volcano. And in the deep sea, off the coast of our volcano, we have a little charnia growing there in the bottom of the deep sea, um, probably surrounded by friendly uh, other beasties, but in the dark. And we can remember this is a time before legs and arms and mouths and ears and eyes and noses. Those things had not evolved yet. Um, so it would have just been lying there at the bottom of the sea, doing whatever it did. Did it munch things? Did it absorb things? Did it have little microbes living on it, which it ate? This is part of the debate. But one day, some magma comes up to our volcano and we have a volcanic eruption and an ash cloud emanates from our volcanic island. Now, what's going to happen? What goes up must come down. That ash cloud, there's going to be ash raining out of that. And we can see in the green arrows and that's going to percolate slowly through the water column onto the slope. And we're going to get a buildup of volcanic ash on the slope. Now. For one of two reasons, that's not going to stay there forever. What's going to happen is either there's going to be an earthquake that's going to jiggle it and it's going to move down the slope, or you just simply build up so much ash that it becomes unstable and it falls down the slope, just like that. And it will fall down the slope in what's called a turbidity current. You can think of this as a kind of deep marine avalanche. Water and sediment all mixed together flowing down the slope. And this is going to be with lots of volcanic ash from that eruption all mixed in. Now, that's very unfortunate if you're an Ediacaran fossil living on the deep sea, because these things can move incredibly quickly uh, and they're going to squash you and they're going to bury you with all the sediment that they leave behind them as they zoom past you. Um, so when this eruption happened and later the turbidity current depositing this ash, um, a very bad day for the fossils, the, well, the, the organisms that were living on the deep sea. However, a brilliant day for paleontology for two reasons. That volcanic ash that's just smothered, buried, killed um, our ancient organisms has done two things. Number one, it's really, really useful to the preservation of these fossils. It lies on top of them. It, it kind of sets like cement and it preserves them in beautiful, beautiful detail. There's all sorts of other processes involved, but we believe that ash, the volcanic ash, plays an important role in the preservation of these fossils, which is why when we go out trying to find new sites, we'll often look for sites that have volcanic ash on top of them. The other reason is there's a, a quite rare uh, mineral in that volcanic ash called zircon, and within there are microscopic amounts of lead and uranium, and we can use that to get very, very precise dates um, about how old these fossils are. So when people ask how old are the rocks at Newfoundland, and I can discuss this more in the questions, um, one of the ways we do that is by looking at the zircons in the volcanic ash, which has buried our beasties. And then of course, more sediment gets deposited, more sediment gets deposited, and the layers build up. And that is how we get the many layers with many different types of fossils in that we find. Uh, at mistaken point. And here is a lovely recreation, an illustration of this drawn by Rachel Simpson, a former undergraduate at the University of Plymouth on their illustration program, worked with us a few years ago to really bring some of these stories to life. And you, there you can see a community of these strange, what we call rangiomorph organisms uh, living on the bottom of the deep sea. And this turbidite, this cloud of sediment coming in, pushing them over and burying them. As I say, bad day for them, brilliant day for us, because now we can study them in wonderful, wonderful detail. And there we go. There's another beautiful image of the D and the E surface there. The D is the slightly grayer one on the left hand side. And then lying on top of it is the E surface with that redder 
uh, tinge. And as I say, this is the best place. Both of those surfaces, the D and the E surface, uh, are about half the size of a tennis court. And each one has got between three and four and a half thousand fossils on it. So if you want to see a lot of fossils in one site and do all sorts of wonderful studies, this is the place to go in the world to understand what's going on with Ediacaran life 565 million years ago. Now, because of that, because it is so amazing, it was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2016. This is to say UNESCO are re recognizing that the Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve is the best place to go to in the world to understand the origins of large complex life and the appearance of the first animals. And what World Heritage Inscription is doing is the world coming together to say, this is a supremely important place and we are telling you the nation with, within which it's found. So in this case, Canada, you really need to look after this place. It's so important that we, the world, have recognized it. And one way we can measure how important it is, is um, by looking at and, and the impact of world heritage status by looking at the number of people who have visited. You can see there a cumulative graph. So starting on day one of the tourist season. Um, so these are the people who are going to visit, go on a long drive along the southern shore to Portugal Cove South. Um, they're not doing tours, obviously, at the moment. But if you want to go, you must, must, must book in advance. Go on the website. Have a look. It's a wonderful place. You then drive along uh, the trail um, out towards the Cape Rates Lighthouse, and then you go on a 45-minute hike. Um, and these are all the people that have, have done that. And what I've done is I've plotted a graph, uh, and as the graph goes up, that's another person uh, going on the tour. And that was what the graph looked like in 2015. Um, now, the start of 2016 um, was a very, very similar year. The curve of the graph is very similar. However, I've marked there when the uh, UNESCO executive board met uh, in Istanbul and immediately that is what happened. So the moment the vote happened, it generates lots of press attention, as it should. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing for the province to have. And that means lots more people are aware of it. Lots more people are aware of its significance and importance. And many more people want to go and see it. So you can see that's exactly what happened in 2016. And that was born out again the year after where we saw that effect throughout much of the season. And of course, if we have many, many more people attending the site, it's a legitimate concern to ask the question whether you're a researcher or you're the government or you're a member of the local community. Do we need to manage this? Do we need to manage the number of people coming to this site? Um, to look after this, because obviously there is an ethical reason that you want to look after these, these sites. They are hugely important, um, but also there's a financial reason. Uh, the tourism industry and, and the booming ge geological to, uh, tourism industry is so important for these communities. Um, if we lose the fossils themselves, then we will lose the geotourism. And also if UNESCO um, see that you're not taking care of these sites, they'll simply take world heritage status away from you. Um, so it's really important that we look at this uh, in a balanced and understanding way to understand what's going on and see if there's anything we can do about it. Now, you might say, well, if there's all these people um, going to the site um, and we're so worried about what might happen, um, why not just collect them all? Why not just chop them all up and put them somewhere, somewhere safe? Chop the surface up, put it in a put it in a museum. Now, there's a number of different reasons um, why you might not do that. Um, one is that it would be a huge and costly um, endeavor. Um, you would certainly lose information. You would um, lose blocks. You can't put things back together exactly as you would have found them. Um, you might just say, well, why don't we chop out just the really special important ones? And historically, that's what happened. Um, here is an image there of the E surface at Mistaken Point, and you can see a missing specimen there, which was removed before the site became protected and now sits within a museum. And you might say, well, oh, that's all the better. That, that specimen is now uh, protected. It can be properly looked after in a museum, and we haven't got to worry about it. 
but that subtracts from what possible future research could be done on it. And I use the example here of that beautiful uh, multicolored diagram there. That's some research that's being done um, by uh, scientists over in the University of Cambridge, where they're trying to understand what these organisms were and how they were living, how they were interacting with, with each other, how they were reproducing, answering all the kinds of ecological questions to try and understand how these things lived and died. And the way they're doing that is by uh, looking at the positions of these fossils on the bed. The bedding plane records um, an assemblage of fossils that all died as a community. So we can look at the positions they're in today and they represent roughly the positions that those fossils were in when they were alive. And we can look at the relationships and the positioning and that can start to give us uh, some indication of how these things were living, dying and interacting with each other. Now, if I go along and chop out some of the fossils, I'm removing data from that data set, which is going to reveal some of the most interesting um, stories about why these things are so important. So that, to, in answer to the question, why don't we just chop them all out and put them in a museum? I hope there's uh, some answers there. Now, one of the first things we've been doing in the research and mistaken point on geological conservation is a monitoring program. So we're very lucky to discover in the uh, photographs um, in Memorial University of Newfoundland's teaching collection, there were some photographs from uh, a field trip that had been done in the mid 90s. Um, and on the left, I show one of those uh, phot photographs. On the right is exactly the same view um, from more than 20 years later, 2018. And you can see the difference that's happened. We've had impacts happen on some of the fossils. There's been a loss of definition in some places. So we know that this surface is changing and we're losing information and the fossils are being damaged. The question is, what are the processes behind that? And is there anything that we can do about it? It may, of course, transpire that there's absolutely nothing we can do about it, um, but at least then we will know. But the question has to be posed and we must investigate. So this is one of the things we've been doing. And we've been doing that with some interesting techniques. Firstly, um, in the top left there, you can see a time-lapse camera. And we've been using these time-lapse cameras for the past three years um, to monitor the site and understand the change that's been going on. And at the bottom there, you can see um, two images. They were taken um, a minute apart, and they were taken on the 25th of January in 2018. And you can see there a way on the second one of those on the right hand side, a wave has splashed up onto the surface and has pushed some pebbles around. So here's a clear indication that's helping us to understand some of the natural processes that are affecting the site. We've also, um, with the very kind support of Professor Phil Manning from the University of Manchester, his colleague there, Bill Sellers as well, um, we've been doing a LIDAR monitoring uh, program where we've been using what's called the LIDAR machine to scan the surfaces and the surrounding gravel slopes that you can see behind Phil there. This is a kind of machine that you mount on a tripod and it spins around and it fires lasers everywhere and it can detect and build a three-dimensional model so that if we make, do a LIDAR scan one year and then we go back the next year, we can do another scan take one scan from the other, and we can understand the change that's happening every year. And hopefully by pairing that with the time-lapse uh, imagery, we can start to understand what's changing and why it's changing. Now, with all these visitors coming to the site, it raises an important question around footwear erosion. Is this a problem? Because with these big fossil surfaces, the only way to look at them is to walk on them, unfortunately, at, at, at the DNE surface. And here you can see a group of people there looking at the, at the rocks, and they are wearing what's called barma booties. These are small quilted uh, booties. They have a, a kind of polyester fleece inner, and on the outside um, is uh, a cotton layer. That's that light blue layer. They're, these are some little booties that were originally designed to keep your feet warm while you're wearing a pair of wellies. Um, and these were bought in um, by the reserve um, a few years ago 
um, with the idea that this, you know, it's it's softer, it's much better for the uh, for the conservation of the site, much better than people walking around um, in their shoes. Now, here's a bit of uh, science for you, because you might say, well, if they're just if they're just shoes, just walking around on a surface uh, a surface so hard as uh, as a very hard 565 million year old stone, how is that going to make any difference whatsoever? But you only need to look at some uh, some historic built heritage, and there's a beautiful example of some uh, very old steps on the left hand side of the slide there, you, and you can see that as people have repetitive, repeatedly walked up and down these steps, they have slowly worn balls of sediment away from these um, these stone steps. So it just shows that while one person were walking on a surface might not make much difference, that repeated over many, many, many days and many years can build up to some real significant uh, uh, change at the site. And when we combine that with what we've said about the immaculate detail in which these fossils are preserved, the fact that some of the very finest elements of these fossils are less than a tenth of a millimetre across, you only need a little bit of erosion to erode away some of the most important paleontology that you can find anywhere around the world. So back to understanding a bit of material science and some footwear erosion. Now, when you have footwear marching around on a, uh, on a surface, there are two types of abrasion, two types of erosion that happen. You have two body abrasion. That is when the, I'm gonna get a shoe actually to show you. That is when just the shoe walks on the surface and the abrasion is simply between the bottom of the shoe and the surface. And there's also something called three body abrasion. That is when between the shoe and the fossil uh, and, and the surface, there is another substance that can freely move around and be pushed around. In most cases, that's something like silt uh, or clay, and, and it will polish the surface away. So we have two body and three body abrasion. Now, from some wonderful material science that was done in the 1950s and 1960s, um, when there was a lot of research to find out what type of concrete to put on the floors of airports and railway stations. Um, we know that three body abrasion is the more significant one for abrading um, flooring surfaces. Um, so we're going to focus on uh, understanding three body abrasion. And the question comes, if we can, of course, remove the sediment on the surface, um, then there won't be any three body abrasion. No supply of silt and stuff to be in between the two surf uh, uh, surfaces, then there can't be any three body abrasion. So this raises the question, how can uh, we remove as much as possible? How can we have a footwear type that transports as little sediment um, as possible? So we designed a little experiment. We put some sediment from where people change their shoes at mistaken point in a tray. And I put a footwear type on and I stepped in the tray five times. And then we measured how much sediment had stuck to the bottom. Um, of that footwear type. And we looked at um, five different types. We looked at the new Barma booty, uh, which is a brand new Barma booty. Um, hiking sock, which is made of polyester, the type you, you know, keep your, keep your feet warm while you're out on a hike. A sports sock, which is uh, a cotton sock, and a pair of shoes, very similar to the ones I just showed you. And what I call an old Barma booty. These are ones that have been worn many times across the season. And the the area around the ball of the foot, the cotton has worn away. And we did the test. And what you can see there is um, not much difference. This, interesting, is for dry sediment. And so we dried the sediment um, about roughly, it doesn't matter, really matter what, what uh, footwear type, about uh, 0.1 to 0.15 grams of the uh, mistaken point sediment will stick to the bottom of your footwear. However, um, Newfoundland, uh, though beautiful and wonderful, um, is not famous for its dry sediment um, or dry weather. Um, at mistaken point, uh, about 45% of days um, have in the in the tourist season have some form of precipitation, though that should not put you off going to see this amazing site. Um, so it raises the question of what this is like um, if we have wet sediment. So what I'm going to ask, we're going to try out some technology now. I'm going to start a poll and you can now vote which do you think is going to carry the most sediment when stepped into wet 
sediment. New Balmer booty, old Balmer booty, hiking sock made of polyester, sports sock made of cotton, or shoes. We have votes coming in, zooming in. We'll leave it for a few moments. So what all we did here is we rehydrated the sediment to the weight it was on the day it was collected. And on the day it was collected was a day that it had rained. And then we repeated the experiment as we'd done with the dry sed sediment and saw to ask the question of how much stuck to the bottom. And I'm going to shall we stop the poll roughly around here and I shall have a look at the results. Um, we have um, with 41% of the vote, vote, old Barmer booty uh, is the people's choice for worst uh, worst conservation outcome. Um, they reckon lots of sediment will stick to that, um, closely followed by walking sock with 23% of the vote, uh, sports sock with 14, oh no, sorry, shoe with 16%, um, sports sock with 14%, and then uh, the people's choice for conservation um, is the new Barmer booty with just 3% of people suspecting that it will carry around um, the most sediment. Well, here, ladies and gentlemen, are the results. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the, the nearly new uh, Barmer booty was in fact the worst. It transported lots and lots of sediment, um, nearly four grams um, per, per foot. Um, and then followed by the old Barmer booty, the sports sock. And what was best was the walking sock followed by the shoe. Now, you may look at that result and say, well, the shoe carries around the least sediment. We should all wear shoes again. Um, but of course, the reason we don't want shoes is that shoes have tread on them and a rock can get stuck in the tread. And although two party abrasion like that is rare, when it does happen, it can be really, really bad. And so we don't want people with shoes with rocks stuck in them scratching uh, the surface. So the result is walking sock is the best. And the reason is that it's made of polyester. Polyester is um, hydrophobic. Um, it is a man-made material and wet sediment doesn't like to stick to it. Um, so I'm really happy to say that this little bit of science um, has changed the policy at mistaken point. We absolutely understand why the Barmer booty um, idea was put in place. Um, it was absolutely well-intentioned. And all we did was a study um, to test that and put some science, um, because what I've been trying to show you is that conservation research in geology um, hasn't had as much research done. So we need to do more research to inform how we can uh, how we can preserve these sites. And what we're seeing here is that um, we should be wearing polyester um, socks. And, and that's what they do at Mistaken Point now. So a lovely little experiment, didn't cost very much. Um, and it's wonderfully changed the policy at Mistaken Point. And there we go, about the Barmer booty. Now, um, we're zooming on and time is uh, of the essence. I want to talk to you about a little bit of ex uh, uh, experimental work we've been doing. Because, of course, this raises the question, well, we can reduce the amount of sediment being carried around, but does footwear erosion at the surface even make any difference at all? Now, I can't likely go to the e-surface and put on some boots and just march around on the surface. We can't sacrifice uh, some of Newfoundland's most important geological heritage just so I can do an experiment about how it wears away. So what we did is we went and got the same rock from elsewhere where it doesn't have any fossils on it. And we brought it back and we set it in a slab of concrete. Um, so I went back to my parents, my dad's a builder, and we mixed up some concrete and we set that. And that's what you can see in the middle of the top of the slide. And then we went to the lovely people at Satra Technologies who test footwear. And rather than testing the footwear, we wanted to see what was the effect on the rock. We don't care what happens to the boot. We want to know what happens to the rock. So we put it in their wonderful machine called the Pedatron. Um, and the Pedatron did 10,000 steps in two days. So that's 100 miles worth of walking on one bit of rock. So we can do, get lots of walking into a very, very short amount of time and see what happens. Now, here's what happened. We did a scan before and a scan after. We subtract the two. Anywhere you can see blue on there is where there's material missing. So 10,000 steps moved 
uh, in some places, more than 0.2 millimeters of rock off the top. Um, now, that's really important. Again, significant. That's bigger than the finest detail in the fossils at the east surface. And you can see there how the areas of erosion um, match up with the tread of the boot that we used. Now, of course, we haven't uh, done this with a Balmer booty yet. This is the first result. No one is walking around with their boots anymore. Um, so this isn't like the, there's a, a risk at the moment. Um, but what we can show is people walking on fossil surfaces do have the ability to wear them away. So it is something we need to be conscious of. No more can we say, well, it couldn't possibly uh, happen. We have now shown that walking on fossil surfaces does have the potential um, to abrade them away. Obviously, we still need to do um, much more research, um, but there's some really interesting results. And it will, we can't just necessarily take this to other sites either. Um, different rock types and different behavior will, uh, will impact sites uh, differently. But we can now show um, that walking on sites does have the potential um, to abrade them away. So this is something that we need to think about when we're conserving sites that get walked on. Now, I want to tell you a, a, a different story now to, to wrap up. Um, I, my first visit to Newfoundland was in uh, 2008. You can see me there um, in the Druk Formation at Mistaken Point on the left-hand side, and you can see the sheer disgust on my face as I look down at this specimen of a beautiful ice hedimorph which someone has tried to steal. Um, that is why it's got such a, a crisp edge to it. Um, fossil theft, not a good thing. Uh, and just another example of why we don't want people chopping stuff out. It removes information. Um, on the right-hand side of the photo there, you can see uh, Dr. Alex Liu, um, who is part of the research group at Cambridge. And in the middle there is an incredibly, incredibly important person. This is Kit Ward um, of the Ward family, uh, who had Trapassi Ward, I named after them. Um, she has been a long-term um, steward of these rocks and also singing the praises of um, the wonderful paleontology that's to be found in, in what is a wider back garden um, of the southern shore. Um, and, and this is really a brilliant example of how local communities are so, so important to the protection of their geological heritage. Kip Ward kind of single-handedly stopped that fossil uh, being uh, stolen. Um, she stood up to these uh, thieves and good for her. And we're all incredibly grateful for the work that uh, she um, and her wider family have done in both protecting uh, these fossils, uh, but also making sure that they're celebrated and pushing endeavors such as the bid for uh, Mistaken Point to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But it raises the question about removing fossils. So there I was, in, in 2008, uh, just a few weeks in uh, to my Ediacaran uh, fieldwork career. Um, and after going to Mistaken Point, we moved up the coast to the Bonavista Peninsula to what is hopefully soon to become the Discovery Aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. Um, and while we were there, we did some fieldwork, uh, Alex Liu and myself, and we found some new surfaces, some new, some new bedding planes, which had uh, lovely fossils on them, and a few um, weeks uh, later, we were joined by the late Martin Brazier, uh, who was both our, our supervisors. Here we are. Um, actually, this photo was taken by Duncan uh, McIlroy in uh, Spaniards Bay. Um, but Martin joined us and we were proudly marching around, uh, showing him our, our new fossil sites. And, and to be honest, the fossil site that we had taken to on this particular day um, wasn't that interesting. It had it was just that it hadn't been noted before, but the fossils on there were of no real significance. We're just outside for the Newfoundlanders joining us. Um, imagine we're just on the coastline just outside of uh, Port Union, between Port Union and Melrose on the Bonavista Peninsula of Newfoundland. And uh, we went for, a, we showed Martin and he looked at them and kind of nodded, nodded along. Um, and then he pointed to this, and there's a photograph on the left hand side of what I took on that day. Um, and Martin's sketch of what he noticed, because the fact is, we had missed this. We'd been looking at this site um, previously, and it wasn't until Martin joined us that he pointed out that there was this strange impression on the rock, which looked nothing like anything else we had ever found in the Ediacaran. Um, and again, Martin's wonderful drawing on the right hand side. So for a number of years, we pondered uh, what this might be until in 2014, um, we published um, 
in the uh, proceedings of the Royal Society, this fo fossil now known as Heutia quadriformis. It is the oldest uh, known organism which has muscle fibers. And that's what those lines are, those strange lines we could see. Um, they are preserved um, muscle fibers, preserved as an impression um, within the rock. And this organism was likely um, related, likely a Nadarian re related to a modern group. And you can see an example there at the top of the page in the middle, that's a, a Storomedusin, um, which is a type of Nadarians. Nadarians being the, um, the group of animals that include things like jellyfish and corals. Um, so this was an incredibly important find because it becomes uh, the oldest evidence of muscular tissue. Um, if you, I'm going to make, if you want to find out more or go and see it, it's now found in the rooms and I can make a link pop up hopefully. Um, so if you want to find out more, um, go to the rooms um, where the specimen is now housed. And we're going to just quickly tell you why it's at the rooms, because I've just been telling you we should leave specimens where they are because they're very important. However, with this example, um, there's a little site where it's found. Um, you can see it's got water running over it, and it's also at the end of a small gully. And the winter storms of Newfoundland come up this gully and they throw rocks um, at poor Heutia, such that in 2014, when we went out there, we could see that there were pot marks around it. It was lucky that Heutia had not been hit by a rock being thrown up by these waves um, up until then. So the decision was made with the agreement of the province, the provincial government, to um, to take the specimen out. And we could do that um, without harming any of the other um, the, the other fossils um, that it was found next to. So we, we, and importantly, rather than using a saw, which creates a bit of a, a horrible scar, um, we used the old fashioned technique of a hammer and a chisel, um, which managed to um, uh, remove it without making a scar. And, and that specimen is now in the ruins, not after a, uh, a quite a long struggle um, by Alex and myself spending three or four hours getting the specimen out. And then you can see a little map there from roughly where it was found. Um, we decided, well, not decided, we only knew one way back to the road. So we walked the um, about two and a half to three kilometres along the red line. Uh, and it wasn't until um, a number of local people uh, pointed out a number of years later that there's actually another path um, uh, along the green line. And this is important because the specimen uh, weighs at least 25 kilograms um, and I had to kind of put it over my back and hobble along. Um, so it's a it's a very, very heavy specimen, but it can now be seen uh, in the rooms. So here's an example of uh, raise this just because it's a beautiful specimen. It's so important to the province um, and to the geopark. Um, but it's an example of a one size fits all rule in geoconservation doesn't work. Sometimes we're going to want to leave things in situ where they're found so that they can be studied properly and try and protect them where they are. But other times we do have to remove the specimen because it's just uh, so much uh, danger. And they have done an absolutely fabulous job of curating this specimen in the rooms. There's a, a photo of it in place. Um, Heutia beautifully lit. These things preserved as impressions. Um, you need very low angle side lighting to make things pop out. So you can see the difference there between that initial photograph I took in the field and what it looks like when you put it in the museum and you uh, light it from the side. And it has pride of place. I believe it's on level three. So the next time, uh, once the rooms is hopefully uh, up and open uh, after the current pandemic circumstances, um, do go along and see Heutia. It is a wonderful, wonderful fossil. And it's a brilliant thing to have in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so in conclusion, I'll just wrap together some of my thoughts on geological conservation. The first is with our feathered friend there, the, the, the gull, that we shouldn't forget about the conservation of nature, um, the natural elements that aren't alive. So yes, this is not to take away from the very important work that's been doing in the conservation of, of plants and animals, but we have to also think about the conservation of geology because these things are all interlinked. Um, the middle image there, the Barma booties, is just to show that we may do things um, with the best of intentions, but we absolutely have to have scientific underpinning for the decisions that are being made. And that's why we need to do work like we're doing with LIDAR scanning and monitoring, and also the really interesting work with the Pedatron and Satra technologies um, to understand and gain the science we need to make the right decisions to look after these very important sites. Um, 
Do we need to um, keep off the rocks? Well, I use that jokey title um, to play on the Oxford theme, really. Um, we're not at a stage where we're going to say you have to keep off the rocks at the moment, but we are now showing that humans do have the potential to have an impact on these sites. And we do have to think about how we're going to conserve them. We can't simply say that these have been around for a million years and millions and millions of years. And what difference is it um, if a few people uh, walk on them or, or, or go and see them? We have to be really precious. We are custodians of this very important heritage and we have to look after them. And that final point with Kitward up there above me, um, is to say that local people are some of the best custodians. They know their neighborhood better than anyone else and they are the best protectors of it. So if you've got something in your back garden, in your local neighborhood, you should go for it. Don't wait for some scientists to come in. You should champion it, you should protect it and make sure um, from the grassroots up that it gets the protection uh, it deserves. Um, just a reminder while I go on to the final uh, few slides, um, if you have any questions, do get them ready, sending them in. Um, I want to say thank you to all sorts of people. Um, this work has been done in, in collaboration with people at Memorial University uh, of Newfoundland. It's been funded by both the uh, provincial government um, and also a federal Canadian scheme called MITAX and also the good people at Satra Technologies. Um, this could not have been done without the support of um, local towns, local groups, people like Legendary Coasts, the Coca Foundation, the Geopark, uh, the people at uh, Trinity Bay North, Trapassi and Portugal Cove South. And then some particular thank yous um, to fellow researchers, uh, Martin Brazier from Oxford, Duncan McElroy at Mern, as well as um, Jess and Rod also at Mern and Phil Manning from the University of Manchester. Um, and just before we get to questions, there are other things you can do. Um, now, if you want to look at the uh, first animals exhibit, I've been talking about the first animals of which we think some of these ediacaran organisms might be, um, you can, even though you can't visit the museum at the moment, you can visit our online exhibition. And there should be now, roughly about now, a button appearing that you can click on click to explore first animals and you can go and see our wonderful web page that tells you all about these things so if you click on that i'm going to pop up a different link in a moment um, so do go on there explore there's wonderful uh, pictures and illustrations and uh, things that you can play around with videos to watch from some of our many many expert uh, researchers in the museum and i just want to show you one other thing we have um, the sketch fab uh, we've been making a lot of three-dimensional models with the wonderful people at Mighty Fossils. Um, and I've just put up a link. You can th see those 3D models. Um, there's a lovely model of Charnia in the top left corner of the, of the slides. On the right-hand side is uh, Clarenville resident Paula Roberts there sitting with a virtual Heutia. That Heutia was not actually there. It was projected uh, in virtual reality, augmented reality. And you can do that from the comfort of your own home on the Sketchfab app, so click the link there. Um, and last but not least, if you have enjoyed tonight and want more um, fun science on a Wednesday evening at seven, um, we're having another one of these in a few weeks time. It's gonna be given by the wonderful Dr. Luke Parry um, from the Department of Earth Sciences here at Oxford and great friend of the museum. Um, he's going to be talking about endless worms, most beautiful, unraveling the fossil record and evolution of annelids and you can register now and i've popped the link up there it's on wednesday the 20th of may at 7 p.m it will be just like this um, except there will be uh, less newfoundland ediacaran fossils and more weird and wonderful worms um, no doubt from the cambrian um, so if you've enjoyed this please do sign up to that online share it with your uh, friends and colleagues you can join us from anywhere uh, in the world. And at that point, I will have a look at the chat and see if we have any questions. Um, let's see. We have a question from Andrew Mann. What about fossil hunters in our country, e.g. digging into the cliffs of the Jurassic Coast, uh, Walton and other places? Um, now, as I was saying in the talk, um, it's really um, important that we don't just have a one uh, 
one rule uh, for everywhere um, because different places need different types of conservation. Mistaken point is what we consider in geoconservation a finite site. And um, what we see when we go and visit there today is pretty much all we're going to ever have. That's why we must cherish it so. The Jurassic Coast, um, the south coast of Britain is different. Um, for the, the uh, Canadians in the room, um, think of the Joggins Fossil Cliffs. It's a similar site, not in age, but in, in style, um, to Joggins Fossil Cliffs in uh, the wonderful Nova Scotia. Um, and what you're seeing there is erosion is slowly revealing uh, more and more. Um, so, and actually, it's important that there are people hunting around. That's why on the Jurassic Coast, um, amateur hunters, um, fossil hunters, are actually important. They have an important role. I'm not saying that there's nothing that can't be done for people to work more closely together, but they play an important role. You know, as soon as there's been a storm, they go out, they have a look. Many of the important uh, finds that have been found have been from uh, uh, from amateurs or professional fossil hunters. So they do in, uh, play an important role. Um, we got a question from Hugh Lee. Why not build walkways just above the rock surface, but not touching it? A, a number of things there. You're, you're not the first uh, person to raise that, Hugh. Um, firstly, it would cost a huge amount. Um, secondly, the waves in the winter are absolutely massive. Um, and there is a worry that if you put that infrastructure right on top of, the, of it, um, the weather might uh, smash it. And that would be a, a, a very bad thing. Plus, you'd also almost certainly have to pin it into the surface, uh, and that would be um, that would be very deleterious to the to the fossils that are found there. But um, yes, a suggestion that have been has been made by by others. Um, Alfie Dickinson asks, "Will the rocks erode away by the sea?" Yes, they absolutely will. Um, there's a certain element of if we do anything, we're we're just putting off the inevitable. E erosion will happen, but it's. The, the more we can preserve and conserve them, the longer they can be studied and celebrated and people can go and, 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 and visit them. It also uh, raises the important point of casting. So we do make replicas of these surfaces without damaging them, which we can then both bring back to the lab to study in lots of detail. Um, and we can also put in wonderful museums. So um, there's casts of these fossils, uh, both in Oxford, in Cambridge, um, in the Geo Centre in St. John's in Newfoundland, in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and many other museums around the world. So important is mistaken point that these can be found uh, in museums all around the world. Andrew Mann asks the question, did he say how it got the name mistaken point? No, I didn't. Um, mistaken point is named mistaken point um, because of uh, the important uh, nautical history uh, of Newfoundland. You, you have to imagine yourself, if you were on a boat um, sailing from the eastern seaboard of America um, over to the UK or Europe, um, you would probably go uh, north first, up the eastern seaboard of, of, of the US and uh, Canada, and, and you, you'd stop off at St. John's as your, your last port of call before coming across uh, to the UK or, or Europe. And you have to travel um, travel east along the southern shore uh, of Newfoundland before turning north to get to St. John's. So at a certain point, you've got to turn 90 degrees to your left. Um, and unfortunately, if you mistake mistaken point um, for Cape Race, which is actually the most southeasterly point um, of Newfoundland, um, you crash into the rocks around there. So this is an area with a rich heritage of um, shipwrecks, um, and that is why it's called Mistaken Point. And it is noted as Mistaken Point in some very, very old maps. So it's clearly something that's been going on um, for a very long time. Um, just before we finish up, I will look if we have any other questions. I think at that point, we've done all the questions. Ah, we have a question from uh, Mark Ferguson, from uh, who's from the rooms in St. John's. Um, Acrops like Mistaken Point and Heutia are seaside and vulnerable to sea erosion, coincidence, or exposed by sea action. How many other sites likely to be in the area? Now, that raises a really important point about erosion. I've obviously presented erosion today as, as the bogeyman, as the demon 
um, both natural and human erosion. But erosion plays a really important story in how these fossil surfaces are uncovered, how they're revealed and how we see them. And um, erosion is important in, uh, in, in finding new sites. Um, so yes, erosion does have a role to play. I think most of the sites, it's a, it is however important to say that most of the sites that we will find have been exposed probably for hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, that is not to say, however, that there aren't new sites to be found um, all around Newfoundland. Um, so be obviously be aware of the law. Um, there's lots of, quite rightly, there's lots of laws protecting uh, the fossils of Newfoundland. Um, but I would say, um, I will never say that everything has been found. There will be wonderful discoveries still to come out um, from the legendary coasts of Eastern Newfoundland um, so if you're out and about on a hike and you see a lovely rock slab and it's safe to have a look, why not have a little quick check and see if there's any wonderful fossils? And if you see anything, uh, drop us an email and hopefully we can let you know um, if it's something important. And I can see we've got a, a question from Thomas Farrell. Um, Farrell or Farrell? Apologies if I said that wrong. Um, a popular Newfoundland name. He says, thanks, Jack. Are there any other sites you would like to see similar protection? Well, we are obviously it's a bit of pioneering science what we're doing in, in Newfoundland. Um, and I think while I do say that you've got to apply things in different ways, some of the science we're doing will be quite significant for other sites where there's a risk of people walking on them. So places like um, dinosaur footprint sites. So we have some in the UK. There are also many dinosaur footprint sites in places like Portugal and Spain. And we're hoping that some of the research we're doing in Newfoundland will not only help the conservation uh, at places like Mistaken Point, but also help other countries with the preservation of their very important paleontological heritage. Ah, we have a message from uh, Sally Lavelle of the Oxford Printmakers, um, who is asking me if I'll do another talk. <laughs> Perhaps I will email you about that, Sally. Um, and we have a question from Mo about what is your view on the Manuels River formation? Manuels River, a hugely, hugely important site um, on the north of the Avalon Peninsula in, in Newfoundland. Um, Manuels River, very famous for its trilobites. And it's part of the reason why, obviously, I've just talked about the Ediacaran today, the Ediacaran geological period. Manuels River is from the Cambrian. And one of the reasons why uh, the Avalon Peninsula, the Bonavista Peninsula and the Buren Peninsula together are so important geologically is that they tell a geological story that goes right through from the very first animals, which we see in places like Mistaken Point and the Bonavista Peninsula, through to important um, turning points in the evolutionary history of animals. So at Fortune Head, we see the appearance of burrowing um, widespread vertical burrowing. Um, and then at places like uh, Manuel's River, we see trilobites with hard parts, hard parts evolved by that point in time. So there's a whole story which um, many of the sites are coming together to work together to share this story. Because if you visit only one site, you're only getting um, one chapter in the book of the wonderful geological story of Eastern Newfoundland. Uh, and they are very much uh, greater than the sum of their parts. So uh, Manuel's River, very, very important. And if you want to know more, I will point you in the direction of Rod Taylor, who is a researcher at Memorial University of Newfoundland, and he is the expert on what's going um, on there. Um, we'll take one final question um, from um, S. Don. Um, how different are these to the Ediacaran of South Australia? Really, really good question there. Um, South Australia, um, they have Ediacaran fossils as well, but the Ediacaran fossils in South Australia are younger. So they're still important to the story of animals first appearing, um, but they are about uh, 15 to 20 million years younger than mistaken point. Um, so the story about the appearance of large complex organisms has already happened. Animals have already appeared at mistaken point, and hopefully we'll hear uh, on another day some of the wonderful work um, that my colleagues in the museum are doing uh, specifically on the fossils at Mistaken Point uh, and Bonavista Peninsula on uh, why they think some of these fossils are animals. Um, and then um, 
we're seeing different evolutionary events um, in the in the the rise of animals at Australia. So um, still uh, incredibly important for fossils of the Flinders Ranges and elsewhere in South Australia. Um, very important to the story. But I am biased. I'm pro Newfoundland, and Newfoundland has the oldest um, large complex life and uh, large uh, ediacaran organisms. So Newfoundland is the best. Um, I think at that point, um, we will uh, wrap things up. Thank you very much for joining us for what has been the first of hopefully uh, many lectures. And just to say, if you had any uh, feedback, um, do please um, pop it in the chat, either to the admin or to everyone. Um, we'll record it afterwards. It's really useful for us. This is uh, the first time we've used this system. So it'll help us to improve um, in the future. Um, and so constructive criticism as well as wonderful praises if there are any to be given um, because we use this, um, any feedback's very useful when we uh, go to people and say, can we have some more funding as well? Um, so thank you very much uh, for joining us. We, I think we had um, roughly uh, over 120 people joining us from all around the world. So thank you so, so much um, and have a very safe week and hopefully we will see you in two weeks time for Endless Worms Most Beautiful, Unraveling the Fossil Record and Evolution of Annelids by Dr. Luke Parry. Thank you very much. <laughs>